let's go. My name is Dennis Gibson. I was born many, many moons ago on December 8, <laughs> 1915. And uh, my first memory as a child was in 1959. You don't remember 1959? That's OK. In 1959, my, my uh, grandfather and my father moved to a little place called Springfield, Colorado, and planted First Assembly of God in, in Springfield, Colorado. So my grandfather was a pastor. My father was a pastor evangelist. And I, I've been a pastor for more years than most of you all are old. And so it, it's, it's, I say that to say this, that it's safe to say that I love the church. I am a church man. When we were kids and, and, and we would play, we didn't play cops and robbers, we played church. And of course I was always the pastor because that's just, hey, I was the pastor's son, right? So that's where it had to be. But, but I think somewhere along the way, um, the church has lost some of its missional DNA that, that, that was placed there by Jesus. And I think we've somewhere along the way lost Shall we say effectiveness? And I, I think I think the decline in, in church growth and the decline would uh, would would bolster that claim. Um, the reasons are myriad, but I, I think the core issue there is is simply that we have lost this missional DNA that was planted in the church by Jesus. I heard a story. Let me let me tell you this story, and it kind of illustrates my point. Uh, this farmer was out in his field, and this guy came by. He was a DEA agent, and he had heard some things about this farmer. So he came out to this farmer, and he met this farmer standing on, on this fence. And so he came up to this farmer and said, I'm here to check out your fields, make sure there's nothing growing out there that shouldn't be growing. And the farmer said, all right. He said, you can go anywhere. He said, this is my land. Go anywhere you want to go. He said, whatever you do, don't go in that field. And that DEA agent said, listen, I'm a DEA agent. This badge gives me the authority to go into any field, any time, any place I want. Nothing out of the authority of this badge stands behind me. I have the authority to do whatever I want to do, whenever I want to do it, and you can't stop me. The farmer said, profusely apologized. Oh, I am so sorry. That You're absolutely right. So he went on about his business. About five minutes later, he heard this guy yelling. He had gone into this field. And about five steps behind him was a Brahma bull gaining on him. <laughs> and he was running across the field, and this guy was yelling, and the farmer yelled out, Show him your badge! <laughs> and and I, I think that the, that, that the church has spent so much time showing what kind of authority that, that we have instead of loving the world like Jesus taught us to love the world. I'm just, I'm just saying. You know, in, in Matthew, the, the fifth chapter, it's where the story begins in Matthew of Jesus' ministry. Jesus starts out, and you, you know it as the Sermon on the Mountain, the, the Beatitudes are there. Blessed are the poor in spirit, you, you know the Beatitudes. In the 13th verse, Jesus shifts a little, and he starts with this narrative. You all know it. You're the salt of the earth. The salt has lost its savor. Wherewith shall we be salted? Uh, you're the light of the world. City on a hill. And you know, in the light, you, know, you get the light, and the light is not hidden under a bushel. Somebody just read that tonight. Uh, so Jesus calls us salt and light to the world. And then this, this passage, the most remarkable thing happens here. Jesus, in this passage, then he says this, these three little words. In the same way, you're the light of the world. So let that light shine, that men may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. And it kind of blows my mind that, that the very next verse, verse 17, Jesus steps back and he says this, that don't you misunderstand why I came. I didn't come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill the law. And I went, wait a minute. You just talked about letting your good deeds shine before men. And, and, and so now here you are, you're talking about, I didn't come to fulfill, I came to fulfill the law. And, and so, and I think that that's what's kind of happened because it happened back then. Just in the in the third chapter, John is is dealing with the Pharisees, and, and he's he's saying, you know, prove by the way you live. Who has told you to repent? But prove by the way that you live that you've repented and come to God. And because they had this law that that, that John and Jesus was not adhering to, and, and I think we've stood as the church by on the sidelines so long and, and yelled law and 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 things to people rather than showing them the transformative power of the gospel that Paul speaks about in Romans, right? 
And uh, so I think the, the, the narrative finds itself here. Let me make sure I'm not going over. Give them the offering here. <laughs> I think, I think the, 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 the core here lies in the fact that, that we kind of misunderstand the law. Because in, in, especially in the era that I was brought up in, older than you guys, an era that you guys don't know anything about, but we were steeped in this idea of legalism. You couldn't drink, smoke, cuss, or chew, and associate with them that do. That was the mantra, or date girls that do, however how you want to say that. But it was a great day of liberation for me when I realized that when the law was given at Mount Sinai, it was not given for redemptive purposes because the children of Israel had already been redeemed from Egypt. The law was given to give the Israelites a way or a standard, if you will, as, as, as uh, uh, Urban McManus said, the minimum standard of what it means to live as a child of God. But Jesus comes in Matthew, this Matthew narrative here, and he talks about the higher standard. And so when Jesus is saying, don't misunderstand why I came, I came, didn't come to, to abolish the law, I came to fulfill the law, Jesus was fulfilling his own word that he talked about himself in John when he said, listen, this is what I came for. I came that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. And I, I just, it's my prayer, because my heart breaks over this, it's my prayer that the church will once again recover this idea of life and life abundantly and live their lives. As Paul told Timothy, I'll close with this. Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 4, 416, keep a close guard on your doctrine and your life. For by it, both you and the hearer shall be saved. Amen. God, may your love and your restorative power rest upon the church for the sake of your name and the sake of your kingdom.